Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar on practical guidance for developing a theory of change. I'm Suzanne Barnard, the Director of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I will serve as your moderator today. So for the last several years, I've had the privilege of moderating our Leading with Evidence, Evidence webinar series, which seeks to bring research and practice together to encourage the development of actionable insights and make learning a little more visible. We have as our goal to offer practitioners and researchers ways to immediately apply learning to programs and practices so that you can gain more clarity and strengthen the utility of your work. Next, please. Today, we will talk about with the developer of our latest edition of Practical Guidance for Developing Your Theory of Change and bring you a real-time example of one organization's journey in the successful creation of a working theory of change. And as always, we will provide time at the end of the presentation to discuss your questions. In our next slide, you can see our speakers for this presentation are Cameron Hostetter, who is a consultant with ORS Impact and who developed our guide, and Giovanni Ford, the Executive Director of the Network for the Development of Children of African Descent, who will discuss how the community factored into the development of their theory of change. Next, I want to take a moment to go over some important housekeeping details for the webinar. After we hear from our presenters, we will hold a question and answer session. There are over 700 people registered for this webinar, so I would encourage you to enter any questions as you think of them throughout the presentation rather than wait until the end. However, we might not be able to get through all of your questions. My apologies in advance. We will keep our attendees on mute throughout the webinar. Please submit those questions by entering them in the Q&A function on the Zoom panel. I will also mention that this presentation is being recorded and the recording and slides will be available later at aecf.org forward slash webinar. Next, let's begin with a quick overview of what the Annie E. Casey Foundation does and why we think it's important for our partners and grantees to develop a strong theory of change. As you can see on this next slide, the Annie E. Casey's found, Casey Foundation's mission is to develop solutions that build a brighter future for children, young people, families, and their communities. In order to do that, it requires us to bring lots of people and organizations together to undertake complex change. We want to make sure that all those partners have a solid roadmap to produce the outcomes they are seeking and a way to measure whether their efforts are even working. We also to develop ways to gather and use evidence as part of our mission to help our grantees bring their work to scale and to ensure that communities are actively involved in determining what they need to thrive and they can build a better future for their children and youth. So in the next slide, a theory of change is really an important starting point for all of this. First, a theory of change can help those involved in a change effort clarify their goals and make sure they're working toward the same ends. Second, it can help teams surface and test assumptions related to adapting and implementing strategies and clarify complicated pathways to change. Third, a theory of change provides a good basis for measurement, experimentation, and learning as you go. For approaches that are complex, where the operating environment is fluid and unpredictable and may influence the strategy or, or even its implementation in an unknown way, a theory of change is an especially important tool. It serves as a compass, if you will, illuminating the desired goals and forming adaptations and identifying opportunities for, for meaningful measurement. Finally, a theory of change can help groups decide whether and how to adapt and expand their efforts for different populations. Now to talk to us more about this, I'd like to turn this presentation over to the developer of our theory of change guide, Cameron Hostetter. Welcome, Cameron. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm Cameron Hostetter, and I'm a consultant at ORS Impact. ORS Impact is a consulting firm based in Seattle, and we partner with those funding and implementing social change efforts to help them develop effective strategies and use evaluation as a tool for learning and advancing equity. 
We've worked with the Casey Foundation in different capacities over the past two decades, including writing the previous guide on developing a theory of change back in 2004. I was thrilled to have the opportunity to work on this updated guide with my colleague, Ann Geenap, who also helped author the previous version. We were particularly excited to bring attention to practices that support equity and inclusion within the theory of change development process. For today's webinar, I'll provide a high level overview of the four main steps for developing a theory of change, which are described in part two of the four part guide. While not a focus of today's presentation, I do wanna highlight that part two also scaffolds these steps with guidance for preparation before embarking on the journey, ways to put your theory of change to use so it doesn't just collect dust, and ideas for visualizing your theory of change as a graphic. Next slide, please. So the first step is to identify goals. Theory of change development often starts by clarifying goals and then working backward to identify what actions, changes, and conditions are needed to realize those goals. In the guide, we define goals as ambitious, large-scale, significant changes likely to occur years into the future. And they may encompass changes for a group of people or a community, such as changes in capabilities, behavior, relationships, as well as conditions of health, safety, or well-being, or changes in systems, including social structures, norms and narratives, and federal, state, or local policies. So a couple example goals might include youth in foster care across King County graduate from high school at the same rate as their classmates. And, uh, in all, and all students in Lake County are reading at grade level by the end of third grade. The guide includes some reflection questions to help teams clarify their goal. Some of these questions include, how do we hope, uh, or what do we hope will be true or different if our work is successful? What is the alternate future we want to see? And what big meaningful changes do we want our work to contribute to so we can realize that future? As well as, will the people who are expected to benefit from our work have a say in determining what the goal is or why it's important? Some considerations for the step um, include uh, just thinking about the, the fact that achieving goals often requires a combination of efforts by many different actors over time, as well as favorable external conditions. So it's often, it's unlikely that just your own one organization's work is going to um, have a chance at impacting the goal on its own. And goals should also be, they should be aspirational and also grounded in current knowledge and context. That is, it should be plausible that the proposed combination of efforts in your theory of change could actually bring about the goal in the future, um, whether that's in five years, 10 years, or 20 years. Most groups tend to arrive at a single goal statement for their theory of change and others might decide on two or three. As you zero in on your goal, it's also important to take time to explore underlying assumptions. So as Suzanne just mentioned, testing assumptions is a core part of the theory of change development process. And you'll hear me talk about it in each step. So what are underlying assumptions and why are they important to the process? Groups working towards social change often operate with beliefs and assumptions that underlie how and why they do their work. And they can be uh, explicit or left more implicit and unspoken. And if they're left unexamined, they can create confusion and misalignment in decision-making. So throughout the process, um, surfacing and interrogating these assumptions is a key part of making your thinking visible and strengthening shared understanding. The goals you identify in this step will anchor the following steps of the process. So it's important to take time to unpack different perspectives about why the goal is important and how near or far into the future it might be reached and under what conditions. With that in mind, don't get stuck at this step if you're having trouble reaching agreement within your group and don't worry about wordsmithing the exact language of the goal. There will be opportunities to refine it, the goal in the next step. So the next step after this is step two, to identify strategies and activities. After coming to some agreement on the goal that will guide your work, um, you'll get to identify the strategies and activities that you want to carry out to advance that goal. Strategies are related sets of activities that reflect your, cho your chosen points of intervention, such as providing direct services, implementing advocacy campaigns, building the field, or influencing social structures, systems, research, or collaborative efforts. An example strategy might be capacity building among grantees or community partners. And the activities for the strategy might be providing training and technical assistance, offering leadership development support, such as coaching and mentoring, and bringing together uh, and supporting communities of practice. 
documenting strategies and activities for your theory of change could look different depending on whether they're well-defined and well-known coming into the process or if they're still being conceptualized and developed. If strategies are not clear at the outset, it can help to first just describe your activities and begin to organize them into groups of related actions that all drive toward the same purpose. The way strategies are depicted in a theory of change might look different from how your work is delineated in individual job descriptions or staffing plans or departments. So thinking at the stage also doesn't need to be perfect or final. Strategies are often refined uh, further in the next step. Also in this step, you'll wanna continue to explore those underlying assumptions. And as you identify your strategies, it's important to clarify why you believe the, your chosen points of intervention and your activities have the potential to actually advance goals while furthering equity. And some ref reflection questions include, do strategies and activities help address the root causes that drive inequitable outcomes? Are they appropriate to the cultural backgrounds of those participating? And are those who will be responsible for implementing the work be well positioned to carry out your chosen strategies. Step three is to clarify the messy middle. So the next step in this process is to depict the pathways of change that connect your strategies to your goal, sometimes called the messy middle. Um, it's basically a process for um, making things explicit that again are often left unsaid. So. This step often begins by identifying meaningful outcomes that you expect to occur as a result of your work. Outcomes are changes that happen among people within organizations or in community conditions. Some changes can happen overnight, some take weeks or months, others can take years or decades. Some example outcomes include increased rate of families maintaining a stable residence, improved processes for data-informed decision-making among staff, increased engagement of parents in schools, and strengthened alignment among grantees supporting an issue. A clear outcome statement typically contains the three following components. So there's the direction of change that's desired so that could be increased, decreased, maintained, improved, greater or fewer. What is changing, whether it's attitude, practice, perception, knowledge, skills, behavior, health, policies, or systems and who or what is experiencing the change. So individuals, program participants, families, populations, communities, organizations, ecosystems. Some outcomes may seem obvious or easy to identify at first, and others may not reveal themselves until you begin describing the change pathways that lead from your strategies to your goals. And this is often done by developing so that chains. So that chains help connect strategies to the goal through a series of logical sequential changes. This process helps bring into focus the short and medium term outcomes, sometimes referred to as interim outcomes, that enable achievement of longer term outcomes and goals. To develop a so that chain, you start by picking one of your strategies and run through the following fill in the blank prompts. We carry out this strategy so that outcome A is likely to occur among a defined group of people or organizations, et cetera, and we want outcome A to occur so that a subsequent change, outcome B, is likely to occur for a defined group of people, organizations, et cetera. And we want outcome B to occur so that a subsequent change, outcome C, is likely to occur, and so on and so on. You repeat that process until you reach your, your goal. So this slide shows a simplified version of a so that chain over to the right. The next slide includes an example of a filled out so that chain. We can go there now. Uh, so the strategy in this slide shows uh, we provide technical assistance to support uh, to support uh, sorry we provide technical assistance to family support and child abuse prevention programs so that providers increase their knowledge about best practices so that providers provide high quality programs so that programs are more likely to result in positive outcomes for parents and families served so that children are less likely to experience abuse and neglect. And finally, it reaches the goal so that all children are healthy and safe. This chain of statements moves from knowledge to behavior of providers and from the quality of programs to the well being of children in the community. Each link is a logical sequence of events showing how implementation of a specific strategy contributes to broader changes. So, after, uh, after creating so that chains for each specific strategy, you can begin putting them together and rearranging emerging outcomes to start visualizing the combined change pathways resulting from your full set of strategies. 
This process is often where the theory of change graphic begins to take shape. And it's also where things start to get more complex. This is okay, expected, and very normal. We often say that the process is as important as the product when developing a theory of change and working through the messy middle tends to be where some of the biggest insights and aha moments happen for groups. So the guide encourages you to look for ways to make your thinking visible, such as depicting strategies or outcomes and goals with large sticky notes on a big wall if you're working in person or using an online collaborative software to work if you're working virtually. Remember to pause and ask yourself where thinking is clear or not as clear and where there may be unspoken assumptions. Lean on your collaborators to gather multiple perspectives and resist the urge to take shortcuts if there are divergent opinions. You'll also wanna explore underlying assumptions about the messy middle in this step. So different assumptions might emerge about who your work is meant to serve or support and how, whether or how your strategies are relevant, respectful and meaningful to people and communities and whether or how your proposed change pathways reflect the status quo or promote certain mental models or biases. An inclusive process is especially important for clarifying the messy middle and prioritizing voices of those who, who have the most to gain or lose from the proposed theory of change can help spark important conversations about how it upholds and advances equity and where it needs to be revisited in order to do so. Um, on the next slide, we'll get to the final step, which is step four. Once you arrive at a solid working draft of the theory of change, you can take a step back and assess how all of the component parts fit together as a whole. This often requires balancing attention to the details and also the big picture at the same time. So you may wanna consider engaging other voices or perspectives beyond your immediate group to help review, pressure test, and provide feedback on the theory of change. So the first part of the step involves testing the logic and relevance of your theory. So for example, you may ask, does the sequence of short-term, interim, and, out and long-term outcomes flow logically as they extend toward the goal? Are there any big leaps or stretches in logic that could undermine your theory? Are there outcomes for which you do not have a strategy or strategies with very few outcomes? Are the strategies and outcomes in your theory of change meaningful and compelling to your key audiences? Have you provided opportunities for their input to be heard? And are their needs uh, and, and interests sufficiently addressed? You would also review and document key assumptions that you've been exploring along the way during this step. Documenting assumptions help them remain useful beyond just the theory of change development process, such as helping you communicate more effectively about your theory of change with internal audiences or external audiences. Reflecting on your goal, you may ask, why does the goal matter to us and to different stakeholders? What evidence supports the importance of this goal? What does our goal imply about the status quo and the change that we're working toward? Reflecting on your strategies and activities, you may ask what actions matter most to advancing the goal we identified and why? Who is meant to benefit from our efforts and who may be left out or potentially harmed? To what extent do our strategies and activities respond to and reflect the culture of the individuals, families, and communities uh, who are involved in our work or who we are aiming to benefit? Reflecting on the messy middle, you may ask, are there certain outcomes or connections between outcomes that our theory most relies on? And if those outcomes are not met, would we still have a viable path toward reaching our goal? These are really important conversations to have. And, and if you're able to document some of the key decisions and assumptions that come out of these conversa conversations and figure out if there's refinements that need to be made to the theory of change or other action steps to be taken, it can be a really helpful process. And note that part three of the guide includes some documentation templates to help with this. Uh, the last part of the step is to analyze external forces in context including the conditions that can enable or pose significant challenges to pathways of change you've identified. Some reflection questions include, in what context or external environments does our theory of change operate? What external conditions would help enable our ability to achieve our outcomes? What external conditions would be hostile to our work and how might we adapt if presented with challenges from these forces? And what would we need to monitor along the way to know what conditions we are facing? What are signals of change that we would pay attention to? So that concludes my high level overview of the four steps. Again, that was a lot of information in a short period of time and there's a lot more information to help uh, support and provide more insight into these steps in the guide, as well as help readers prepare and care, prepare to carry out this process and visualize their work. I will now turn it over to Giovanni who will share his experience about developing a theory of change with his organization. Well, thank you, Cameron. Uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, 
we uh, have been looking forward to this uh, this day, and I'm really excited to share uh, some of our experience in developing our theory of change. Uh, we found it necessary to develop a theory of change around a model replication and systems change initiative at our organization. Uh, the initiative is called Think Different, Do Different, uh, and it's really about thinking differently about what it means to support children and families to become self-determinizing. And so in uh, this presentation, I'll share a little bit about how we thought about or approached developing our theory of change, as well as some key considerations that we had to take into account. Uh, but first, I'd like to give a little bit of background on who we are and what we do and why we found it necessary to develop a model replication. So uh, our organization, uh, Network for the Development of Children of African Descent, we are a culturally specific family education center that focuses on literacy and identity formation for our children. Uh, we provide a range of direct services that include after school and summer reading interventions that are culturally based, parent engagement and education programs that help parents uh, develop strong literacy and cultural foundations in their home, as well as advocate for education, uh, educational outcomes and success for children. We also uh, provide training uh, and professional development support services to schools and libraries and other human service uh, providers. Uh, our organization actually is an outcome or an outgrowth of a statewide systems change project. That systems change project attempted to build relationships within culturally specific communities and have community voice inform how systems need to change so that children and families would have access to culturally responsive support in educational services. And so our community came together uh, in that systems change project and said, we need to build an independent institution that focuses on learning. What does it mean and what does it look like to help our children and families make critical connections between literacy skill development and forming healthy African cultural identity? And so over the past 25 years, we have been building a body of evidence around how culture, culture and cultural approaches makes a difference in terms of children taking charge of their own education, families and parents being able and equipped to support their own education, as well as the education of their children. Uh, and as I said, uh, we are a learning organization. And so as we have been building this body of evidence, we have been sharing some of our lessons learned and best practices with schools and other service providers. Uh, back in 2012, uh, we had an opportunity to kind of get thrust into the national spotlight. Uh, we were awarded a white House Champion of Change Award, which uh, really showcased the impact of our cultural approach and how it's making a difference in the lives of children and families. During that process, during that period, uh, hosts of community members came together and uh, helped us think deeply about how to scale and how to replicate the lessons that we have learned. I'll never forget uh, in one of the community meetings, uh, the uh, state education commissioner at that time, she gave us a word of caution. She said, as we are thinking about replicating what we've learned, we have to be aware that often institutions like schools are looking for a recipe or a how-to manual to duplicate what we're doing. And we decided that is not what our intent is. What our goal was is to share the key operating principles that are at work in our programs. The hypothesis or the theory is that if others can adopt our operating principles and embed the principles into their own work, 
that they would be able to have a positive impact on children and families. And so those conversations led to us creating our Think Different, Do Different Educational Affiliate Network Systems Change Initiative. If you can go to the next slide. So this is a uh, image of our uh, theory of change. Uh, and as we began to think about developing this theory of change, two things uh, stood out as most important. Number one, we needed to find the right consultant that would guide us through a process of reflecting on our work, reflecting on the stories uh, uh, that we've heard from community elders, from parents, from systems leaders. And so we found a consultant that was very aware of our work and our approach, specifically our cultural approach to working with families. The consultant also was very connected to our cultural community and had worked with other culturally based community organizations. The second thing that we found it important to do is to practice Kujichagalia, self-determination, right? to name for ourselves, define for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. And so we needed to develop our own set of guiding values that would shape and inform how we would approach developing a theory of change. And so these four guiding principles emerged out of a number of conversations with staff, with community members, and with families and children. Number one, we wanted our theory of change to be about describing change as it happens rather than prescribing change. And so our strategies, our goals, our outcomes, we understand that change is iterative and developmental in nature. And so we did not want to map a theory of change that was a prescription, but rather a tool that would allow us to recognize, name and describe change as it happens. Number three, we value interconnectedness of experience, change, and transformation. And what this means for us is that the work that we're doing with children and families, it informs and impacts us individually as staff, as well as our organization. Again, we are a learning organization. And what that means is we work with children and families and community in order to learn from them how best to reach, teach, affirm, and support. This is the, the idea that in our Think Different, Do Different model replication, we're working hard to help others adopt that learning mindset so that they move from a transactional delivery of services and adopt a mindset of learn from those that we serve. Number four, we sought to honor the power of symbolic knowledge, right? Uh, and as you can see in the bottom of our theory of change, this root system of key operating principles, right? During one of our staff conversations, uh, our associate director, Susan Martin, she was talking about some of the things that we had been hearing from schools and school leaders and teachers over the years. And she talked about the seeds that we were planting in the training and how the different seeds that were planted were received differently by the individuals. And so this whole notion of planting seeds that could take root, that would provide the support system that undergirds the services that our families uh, receive. Uh, this idea of planting seeds led to the consultant saying, why don't we think about like what the seeds and the germination process and the taking roots, how might that look in a theory of change? And so these four guiding principles really help inform and shape how we thought about our theory of change. 
If you can go to the next slide, I'd like to uh, focus in on a couple of uh, key aspects of our theory of change. Number one, in the center of your screen, you'll see our goals. So our model replication initiative, the goals are to improve education outcomes for our children. Another goal is to strengthen and stabilize families. And thirdly, to build cultural competencies among those who work with African descent children and families. These goals really were the anchor, the trunk behind what we're attempting to share and help others uh, adopt in uh, this model replication process. Number two, uh, our strategies, right? How will we work towards accomplishing these goals is our Think Different, Do Different initiative. We provide training and professional development supports to those who work with our children. We provide opportunities for those who engage in our trainings to network and learn from and with one another. And we provide consulting and coaching, as well as curriculum and resource development supports. Number uh, two, if you, if you shift your focus over on the right-hand side of your screen to outcomes, some of the outcomes that we are seeking to describe in those who participate in our Think Different, Do Different is increased capacities to serve our children and families. We want to uh, our affiliate members to be better positioned to learn from children and families that they serve. And again, to improve their cultural responsiveness of the services that they provide. Key to this whole idea of cultural competencies and cultural responsiveness, our thinking and our approach to cultural competency is it's about services supporting children and families to become more competent in their own cultures, as opposed to service providers becoming competent in the variety of cultures amongst those that they serve. And so our Think Different, Do Different initiative is about operating principles that create the conditions for families to become self-determinizing, and to become more culturally competent in studying themselves, their history, their culture, their heritage. What our evidence in our literacy programs have shown is that this approach to cultural competency has increased reading scores, academic outcomes, as well as family stabilization measures as evidenced through a variety of independent research and evaluation studies. Uh, if you can go to the, to the next slide, some of the things that we had to take into consideration as we were developing our theory of change is number one, keeping our mission front and center. Right? We exist to strengthen the cultural connections within communities of African descent that promote, sustain, and enhance the healthy development of our children. And the key cultural connections is helping our children and families connect literacy skill development and forming healthy African cultural identity. And so as we were in the process of developing this theory of change, we had to keep the mission front and center. Number two is we found it necessary to practice Sankofa, which is a process of looking back to move forward. Number three, we had to engage stories and storytelling. So for us, that meant talking about our experiences in delivering services, our experiences in training and sharing our lessons learned, but also how those stories were impacting us individually and personally, and how our personal experiences informed how we carry out our work. Number four, reflect and respond to important process questions. So we had to think deeply about who our target audiences were for our Think Different, Do Different initiative. 
What are conditional issues and factors that would impact their ability to actually adopt uh, and understand our operating principles and eventually replicate our operating principles? Number five, we needed to recognize that cultural communities, and in our case, communities of African descent, we have a long history with research, researchers, and research methodologies. And so we had to recognize and account for the harm that research has done and value add that research could provide. Just to give you a, a quick example, uh, we've recently uh, taken on a project with a local library system here in Minnesota. Uh, we've been training them uh, around utilizing our cultural home learning kit curriculum uh, as a tool for them to engage African African-American families in studying and learning about African history, culture, and heritage, and community standards. And so we provided intense training to the library system. Uh, and following the training, two of the cultural specialists in one of the libraries uh, said that they wanted to uh, really design or take the lead on designing the evaluation of the work that they would do surrounding our home learning kits. And uh, as we began to work with the cultural specialists in designing research, their first comments suggested that they were not as confident as, as they had hoped to be around designing an evaluation. And so what we had to do is utilize some of our operating principles in our Think Different, Do Different initiative to help them connect their own personal experience working with children and families in the libraries, connecting their experience with the tradition and history of African knowledge systems and indigenous ways of approaching research and evaluation. As they began to make those connections with how African people since the beginning of time have participated in action research, they began to see themselves as researchers, as competent, as qualified, as enough, as one of the uh, cultural specialists said, she said, I am enough, I am equipped, I can design evaluation and research because we are the experts in our own experience. So these are some key considerations that, uh, that we had to account for as we were developing our theory of change. So I hope that kind of gives a little bit of a, uh, a, a sense of how we were able to engage community, keep our mission front and center, and approach theory of change in a way that would support and allow us to build upon our successes and create a vision for where we want to go in terms of replicating uh, the essence of our model. So thank you for this opportunity to share. I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Well, hi there. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes oh, great. All right, good. We're having just a few technical difficulties, but um, I may look a little different because now I'm on my phone. So um, let's, let's get started. Thank you so much, Cameron and Giovanni. Um, really, really fabulous presentations. Appreciate it. And I'm sure our audience is clapping silently. We just can't hear. Uh, so let's start with a couple of questions. They've been coming in. We've been monitoring them. Let's start with a couple um, of the earlier ones. Um, here's one. What, and this is probably for you, Cameron. Um, what is the first step to get started in the theory of change? What's the first thing you need to do, especially with multiple audiences, I would imagine? That's a good question. Um, if, and maybe there's... <laughs> It's a longer, more complicated answer, but I think uh, a lot of it has to do with deciding on sort of the purpose. Like, what's your what's your entry point uh, for for doing a theory of change? And the and the guide has a section on uh, different entry points in in step two, or sorry, part two of the guide. So it, it could be that there's a, a new initiative starting up that you have you're you're having to do some some strategy development around, or there's a, a need for evidence and you haven't had a, a, an ability to 
kind of gather or capture that data. And there's kind of a sense that you might have uh, new opportunities to um, build out some evidence that would help you either achieve more funding or, or to be more successful in your work. So I think really uh, understanding that sort of coming in, what's kind of your context uh, is a really important piece. And also um, identifying for, for who is it for? Is it for your organization? Is it for, again, for fundraising purposes or for building a team and onboarding staff? Um, and there's also kind of understanding uh, the the time frame and kind of vantage point for what your 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 change process is going to unfold in, uh, as well as just capacity, internal capacity as an organization. Again, I I, I appreciate that Giovanni mentioned working with a consultant, not because we're a consultancy, but because there's there is uh, both value in having an outside perspective to help facilitate some of these conversations, but also just something that organizations and groups need to recognize that this this does take a lot of work. And so also just kind of assessing your own organization's capacity uh, to engage in, in this kind of process, which is not, a, it, it's not a quick process, even though the timelines can, can vary across different organizations based on how complex the work is, how large, how many stakeholders you have involved. Um, but definitely knowing that this is a, not a kind of one, you know, quick uh, hour long conversation to get you to a theory of change. Oh, and you're, I think you're on mute, Suzanne. Oh. If you're talking, Suzanne, I can't hear you. I'm not sure if your audio is, if you're able to hear us. We can message her in the chat. Well, I'll uh, uh, add on to uh, what you shared, uh, Cameron. Uh, for us, it was important for us to, to really get clear about how we're thinking about a theory of change. Um, when we first began the conversation, a theory of change was kind of like this thing outside of ourselves. And so we had to challenge ourselves to think in real practical terms, what does change from our cultural perspective, what does that look like? And I'll never forget a, a, a one of the one of the stories that popped in my head as we started the conversation is how my mother taught us, my siblings and I, how she liked the uh, carpet in our living room vacuumed, right? So she wanted to see a change in us. She wanted to make sure that we had the ability, the confidence, to 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 uh, vacuum the carpet. And so she described what she wanted. She showed us, she coached us through it, and then she stepped back and watched us do it. And so what these types of conversations, when they're tied to like real life, it helps us understand that change, outcomes, research, evaluation, it is not something outside of ourselves. It's a part of how we live and breathe in our day-to-day -day experiences. And so how we think about our work affects how we do our work. But learning really is about connecting it personally and intrinsically so that it's not okay. transactional. Okay. We are connected to uh, the change work that we are doing. Thank you. I hope you can, can you hear me now? We're Yes, we we're doing okay. Giovanni, <laughs> thank you for stepping in. That was awesome. Um, so I think we had, um, hold on a second. Let me give you one more that we have that I think might be good for both of you. Um, how do you know, um, both from, you know, the multiple partner perspective and also just, you know, from the organizational perspective when you're pulling a theory of change together, how do you know you've aligned the right actions that will affect the changes that you and your communities want to see happen? How do you get around? I think, Giovanni, you, you discussed that somewhat, and I think, Cameron, you've also mentioned it, but it seems like um, there's uh, maybe a little bit more detail needed around the actual detail of um, getting past those like stuck points, I guess. I don't want to put words in somebody's mouth, but that's what this looks like. Do you want, or yeah, do you want, do you want to start, Giovanni, or do, you, or do you want me to start? Oh, this, this is for both of you. Yeah. For both, yeah. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll start. So um, for us, it really was about um, reflecting and examining 
the strategies that we were already doing and to describe for ourselves what works and how can we build on what works. So it really was, you know, in research terms, kind of post hoc, right? What, uh, and it's also Sankofa, looking back in order to move forward. And so in our case, it wasn't about creating something new from nothing. It was about reflecting and attempting to learn from what we had already experienced and then mapping out a plan for building on those lessons learned uh, to expand and broaden our reach. I think that's a great, I mean, I, I can only add to that a little bit by saying, um, again, that kind of starting point, it sounds like, you know, Giovanni, your organization really took stock of where you were at and what you were building from and building on. And I think that's a really important kind of model for, for how to think about developing a theory of change. And again, it's going to really depend on uh, the starting point and kind of context for which if, you're, if your work is very well defined and, and uh, or if it's very emergent or if you're uh, starting again, a new initiative that, that, is, that is emergent, this, this guide isn't necessarily going to be a, you know, how to develop strategies, so to speak, like strategy development in and of itself is, is, a, is a very big um, kind of world, but it, it does dovetail really well with that. Some people use their theory of change as their strategic plan. And so I think it really comes, uh, there, there's, there's that process again of reflecting in these conversations you're having with your collaborators of understanding sort of who are the people who need to have a, who have a stake in this or need to have a say in this process um, to help even kind of define what, what is the context in which we're, we're working in and what are the points of, innovation, points of intervention or activities or strategies that we really feel are important and likely to impact the goals we have and are culturally relevant and that does involve some kind of looking out, looking out into the world and understanding, again, if there's information you don't have that you would need to go gather to help you answer those questions, sometimes that's an important um, part of the process. And uh, it may be that as you're developing your theory of change, you think that there's some strategies that are really concrete and amazing. And as you're going, you're realizing, actually, as I'm trying to map out some outcomes that come out of this, this feels like it's really different or maybe not the direction we want to go. And maybe there's, a, there's other outcomes you've generated as being really important and there's not actually much happening from the strategies or activities that are leading into that. So some of those questions, it's, it's an iterative, iterative process. It'd be something that if, if people take away kind of one thing from this, from what I've said, it's like really just like iterating on, on the work and allowing this to be an, an evolution that benefits from the collective kind of wisdom of not doing this one person by themselves, but drawing on input from uh, others who, who have a, a stake in the matter. Thank you, thank you, Cameron and Giovanni. Um, this is a maybe a related question. Um, this is for Giovanni. Your organization's parent power literacy and advocacy workshops improve workforce and family stabilization outcomes work is very exciting. Could you please expand on the outcomes you've been able to see and how you were able to validate the experiences of parents and caregivers through learning the milestones they've achieved? Um, well, and uh, then there's a, another sort of similar question I can, I can so answer that when you. Some of the outcomes uh, that, that we've seen, 300% um, of families that complete our Parent Power Program have increased job skills training, GED completion. Uh, those who are participating in TANF are actually seeking jobs, obtaining jobs, and retaining jobs. And so these are very, very important um, indicators for family stabilization. Um, we have had the privilege of working closely with uh, one of our local counties that manages the TANF system. And uh, through that partnership, the county designated a evaluator who captured the outcomes, the workforce outcomes, so that together we and the county can tell the story of the work that families are doing to connect our literacy identity work and how that translates to improved family stabilization and workforce outcomes. And so really the, the, the collaborative nature of community working with systems, but community really driving the work 
that is done collaboratively with systems has been really, really important. And again, our community approach to driving the partnership is driven by the experiences and the work that the families are doing. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Giovanni. Uh, let's see, um, this is for Cameron. Um, Cameron, can you talk more about the messy middle what did that look like, sound like, and what are what are some similar conversations around that? We think we're having those as an organization, but uh, it seems, and it does seem messy. Yeah, um, so the, yeah, that's, that's a great question. And uh, there's there's kind of this, I think one, one of the models that I think about with the messy middle is thinking about this whole process is, is a way of moving groups from having very divergent conversations where there's maybe, again, maybe the goal or kind of the challenge at hand is, is somewhat understood, but how do you go about making change towards that? There might be lots of different opinions or evidence to consider. And the conversation can start off uh, and going more divergent where there's like, the, the options are getting wider and wider and wider. We could do this, we could do this. Are we really sure that it's this? Um, defining the problem, uh, defining kind of the context that that can become something where there's lots of options on the table to consider and uh, it's important to not want to jump too quickly to having some convergence where you're converging around some alignment and agreement around this is, these are the things, or, you know, this is, this is the goal. These are the strategies that it, it really has to do with um, taking enough time to, again, allow those conversations to be iterative and to understand if you are in that messy middle place, a lot of times that's where pe people do get stressed out or frustrated or think, right. wow, this is taking a lot of work. This is maybe, you know, um, are we really, can, can we find a shortcut here to kind of get around having to deal yeah. with some of these hard questions? And so um, I think it's just really encouraging folks to not jump out of that place too quickly and to, again, figure out ways if you are getting stuck. I mean, you also, you definitely don't want to get, get stuck in a place that's not productive, but um, if you're, you know, there, there's ways you can you can, we have some, some tips in the guide around what happens if you're, if you are getting stuck at that place. Um, so I definitely encourage folks to, to look into that and would be happy to share more if, if, if there's more Suzanne that um, you think would be helpful to address as part of that question, but. Uh, no, thank you for bringing up the, the tips in the guide. Those are, those are really useful. Uh, I've been, I've been looking through those myself and uh, I, I appreciate those in there. So yeah, I thank you for directing attention to that. Um, so here's a, uh, a question I think probably for, for both of you, um, somewhat related, but have, Giovanni and Cameron, have you seen examples where um, a theory of change has functioned uh, in, in the way of helping move us past a difficult conversation when you could refer back to the theory of change? Did it get you to where you needed to be or did there have to be other outside conversations first to bring back to the theory of change discussion? Can it all happen simultaneously, I guess? So ch change is always happening. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, Sometimes, That's for it, sure. sometimes <laughs> it doesn't feel so good. Uh, but what we have found um, really useful is during difficult, whether it's the messy middle or during um, change processes, again, to lift up the power of storytelling, right? So uh, we collect stories, impact stories from families, from children, from our tutors, from those that we train. And so lifting up and talking about specific real life stories allows us to kind of almost rise above or transcend whatever the challenge is and then connect that story to one of the leaves in our theory of change. So the power of storytelling can actually help us transcend the condition that caused the uncomfortability or difficult conversation, right? Because mm. it's it, uh, otherwise it's real easy to get stuck on the conflict as opposed to what is the conflict attempting to birth in us. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Cameron, did you, did you yeah. want to add anything? Mm. Um, I think one thing, I mean, as far as like, as part of the theory of change uh, process, something that can help and probably as part of almost any group process is being really explicit about where where power is held within yeah. 
the group and who all is, is, is a part of this conversation and be really clear about how decisions will be made. And definitely wanting to encourage like avoiding um, kind of asking for tokenized input and then but already having a clear idea in mind if you're the ED of the organization, no, it's gonna look like this because this satisfies my worldview as opposed to um, again, having to uh, in, in, you know, s listen to other people's input and maybe there's, there's something really wise in that input. So I think having uh, the, as you, as you kind of structure the process, whoever, you know, oftentimes it is like a, an ED of, of an organization, maybe some staff, or maybe sometimes there's board members involved. Sometimes there's community members involved, but structuring that process so that there's um, some clarity about and transparency around where decision-making power is held. And then that can help when there are those difficult, difficult conversations um, kind of make it easier to understand uh, kind of what's at, what's at stake and, and who all um, should have a voice in that. And uh, I think theory of change, again, as this tool for alignment, it can be a really, really powerful tool, especially for people to, to go through together who are involved in implementing uh, a change effort because it, it yes. really can, can help surface some of those different operating beliefs and assumptions. And um, again, sometimes it helps to, to pause and take a step back or to, to kind of take the temperature down if need be. And other times it's helpful to, to sit in that space. So I don't know if that, if that totally answers the question, but that's the first thing that came to mind. I think those are both great answers. Thank you both. Um, and Giovanni, here's the, the question I was sort of miming for you earlier. I didn't realize that nobody could hear me, but you telepathically figured out how to answer it. But I, wanted, I want to go back and just revisit it to make sure for the person who submitted it that that you heard the whole question so that it was a complete answer. Um, so uh, the question was, um, and Cameron too, I think you could weigh on this. Have you seen examples where, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, that's not the right one. Um, how, uh, how do communities react to terminology around theory of change? You know, that's a pretty Western-based concept. We've talked about that. We've addressed some, it somewhat. It's in the guide. You, know, Giovanni, you and I talked about it, talked about it earlier. Um, it's, that's, it's important, though. I mean, what are, what are what is some language we can say to our partners uh, that doesn't sound like we're all working on this theory of change or, uh, you know, your illustration around the tree, Giovanni, is beautiful. And I think that also helps explain it with not, a, you know, using a theory of change language solely. Um, what are some other examples that you've seen that are effective uh, I guess, you know, labels for theory of change or alternatives for theory of change. Well, um, in our case, uh, one of our seven uh, operating principles has to do with adopting an action research uh, approach where those who are most impacted by an issue are the ones who actually design the research. And so what we have been able to do is we have the opportunity to work with high schoolers, African-American high schoolers, uh, and we introduced a African knowledge system. And in this case, it was the Dogon knowledge system. Mm -hmm. And what we learned from the young folks was, was phenomenal. Number one, they had no previous knowledge that there were other knowledge systems outside of a European or Western knowledge system. They were able to take and connect the Dogon knowledge system, which is about descriptive knowledge, analytical knowledge, comparative knowledge, active knowledge, and spiritual knowledge. They were able to see themselves inside of that Dogon knowledge system and then approach their task of designing an action research project because they saw that research is a part of our cultural tradition. So I'd share that example. Um, our advice would be to become familiar with indigenous knowledge systems outside of Western European knowledge systems so that we can introduce the fact that there's more than one way to be human in the world, which means there's more than one yeah. way of knowing. Right. Um, so there isn't a specific set of here's some alternative language. I think the opportunity is deeper than that. It's really to decolonize how we think about what it means to be and what it means to know and to connect it with 
cultural knowledge systems and cultural histories. Thank you, Giovanni. And uh, Cameron, I just realized we're, we're pretty much out of time. So um, I wanna take this the minutes, seconds we have left to thank you both so much. This was so useful and I'm sure Again, everyone's silently applauding. You've, uh, you've given us a lot to think about, both from the te technical aspects of theories of change and from multiple partner involvement and just real thoughtful ways to, to get this done. So I appreciate it. Um, you'll see in the last slide uh, that we have some resources that both Cameron and Giovanni have provided us. And um, once again, thank you so much and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone.